Hello and welcome to In Conversation with the History Holders of the American Dance Therapy Association, a project made possible by the Marion Chase Foundation. My name is Dr. Jacelyn Biondo. When I first conceived of making these videos, I hoped to capture the words of the women who studied with the firsts in our field, Marion Chase, Trudy Shoup, Mary Whitehouse, Alma Hawkins, Blanche Evan, and Lillian Espinak. What culminated in the process was an opportunity to have these women share their stories and their memories in their own words, and to capture these parts of history for future generations. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoy our conversations. I am delighted to be joined today uh, by Dr. Miriam Roskin Berger. And Dr. Berger, thank you so much for being here. It's a delight to have you with us today. I'm really happy to talk with you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a delight to be with you. Thank you. So we're gonna jump right into the questions. And the first question that I have for you is if you could share with whom and where you studied dance therapy. Um, well, my first experience with dance therapy was with Marion Chase at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington uh, for about three weeks in 1956. I was went down to study with her, to work with her because I was writing my senior project at Bard College on dance therapy. And she allowed me to come down and, and work with her. I think I was one of the first, first students she had down at St. Elizabeth's. And I also worked later on uh, with Rhoda Winter Russell in New York. So you were doing a senior project, I'm imagining in a bachelor's program? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. On dance therapy. So how did you even know about dance therapy at that point? Uh, I had been to Connecticut College, uh, the dance program in the summer in 1955. And I was taking, a, I think it was a Laban course, and Helen Priest Rogers mentioned dance therapy. And I jumped up and I said, what? <laughs> and she, she told me about Marion Chase. And uh, I went, I, I you know, contacted her at St. Elizabeth's and went to study with her because I was a psych major, a psychology major, and a dance minor. And so when I first heard about dance therapy, I went to, went to do it. Hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what it was about dance therapy that drew you into the field and, and made you decide that that's what you wanted to pursue? Well, as I said, I was a psych major. I was, mm -hmm. my goal, I thought then was to be a clinical psychologist. And when I heard that there was such a field as dance therapy combining the two fields, I thought that would be a lot better. And I had a professor at uh, Bard College, Werner Wolf, who was a, an expert in nonverbal communication. Mm. So that was another impetus for me. Mm -hmm. And Thinking back to your time with Marion, can you um, share a little bit about your experience of studying with her? Well, I remember when I went down to St. Elizabeth's, I was quite anxious and fearful <laughs> about the whole experience because I had no idea what I was getting into and I was you know, brought right onto the wards with her. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it was, um, so my main experience with her was going right on the wards and, and, and working with her. And um, so I don't, um, I can't, I mean, there, were, there was things that happened at the hospital that I remember, uh, which I can, she was working with a, a group of <clears throat> veterans. There were a lot of veterans after the Second World War there, and there was a group of naval veterans that she was working with. And <clears throat> I remember that was a very important experience because I watched her as she was uh, dealing with them, and she was working with the assistants who were also helping to modulate what, what was going on. And then there were there were patients in that hospital who had 
had um, brain surgery uh, and were worse for it, let's put it that way. And there were patients that we would pass at that time where they were still having them strapped to, to the to beds in, in constraints. And that was, um, you know, very, very disturbing to, to see. Um, but the main experience with her is to, was watching her go and being with her on the wards as she went in and contacted the patients and started to move with them and that how she did that so uh, powerfully and so with such um, sensitivity. Mm -hmm. so that was the main thing I remember from that. Mm -hmm. She also told me I talked too much and to tell you the truth, I was very, very silent. So I have no idea where she got that from. <laughs> But I do remember that, and it always puzzled me. Hmm. Is there anything about um, Marion's teachings that stood out to you in particular, either the way she taught or a lesson that you learned or anything like that from her? I, I can't remember anything specific. Unfortunately, it was just the whole experience, which I, I guess I, I, I was immersed and and took in her whole way of, of functioning and her whole way of, of operating non-verbally. I don't remember a lot of what she said to me, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting because she, she she didn't talk a lot, but she certainly talked. Mm -hmm. But I, I think what, what I learned from her was non-verbally was picking up movement from the patients, how, mm -hmm. you know, that she was doing that and that I was echoing that and learning how to do that with her. That was something that came to me that I understood right away. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the main thing I learned from her is, is using that empathy of picking up movement. And, but I can't remember her you know, articulating that to me in words. Mm -hmm. I think I, that's the main thing I learned from her. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you you watched her non-verbally connect with the patients and you were non-verbally connecting with her as your teacher almost. It seems like this cycle of all of you in, embedded in this non-verbal kind of sense of learning and experiencing together. Exactly. You put it exactly what, what I was <laughs> trying to say. Yeah. Because, like I said, I don't, I don't remember her uh, words that she said to me where she taught me something specific. Mm -hmm. It was a constant nonverbal experience of, of tuning into her, mm -hmm. tuning into the patients, tuning into her, tuning into the patients, and mm -hmm. as you said, a cycle of experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that really speaks to the practice, right? Because although you can't necessarily remember the words that she shared with you, you remember the feeling and the embodiment of watching her. And perhaps when we work with our patients as well, it's not so much the words that we're saying to our patients and clients that they're receiving or holding on to, but it's the experience of the practice of dance therapy. So it's almost like your way of learning dance therapy was the way the practice works. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You put that very brilliantly. Oh. <laughs> exactly, because as I said, that, that's what I learned from her, but I can't remember her ever specifically elucidating that mm. in, in that kind of verbal exchange. Mm, I love um, that. I did learn that way, yes, mm. absolutely. Mm. And when I wrote about uh, dance therapy, when I wrote this, uh, I was writing a senior project for my undergraduate uh, work at Bard. I talked about a kinesthetic empathy as being the most important kind of concept in dance therapy, mm -hmm. uh, um, because I was trying to articulate what I had learned from, from Marion. Mm -hmm. So thinking back to your studies of becoming a dance therapist, what, what would you say um, maybe one or some of your fondest memories are about studying the practice? Well, 
the experience at St. Elizabeth uh, with Marion certainly was a very important and, and dear experience. A year or two later, I worked at Manhattan Psychiatric Center, which was then called Manhattan State Hospital, with a dance therapist, Rhoda Winter Russell, who had come from Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, where she first started doing dance therapy. <clears throat> and I worked with her for quite a while. And um, I don't have specific memories that I could share with you, but I have, you know, that was a very deep experience for me working with her in a hospital constantly. And, um, and she worked differently than Marion. So that was an important um, experience as well. Mm -hmm. And do you think, Mimi, you would be able to articulate what the essence of dance therapy is as you understand it from Marion's work? Well, one of the, the, the essence from Marion's work is the mutual experience of kinesthetic empathy between therapist and client and group, that that is where the trust is built, that is where the information is received and exchanged. And the nonverbal exchange of information on levels that cannot be expressed in words that are very important. Um, so that uh, from Marion, I think I learned the importance of the nonverbal communication and the importance of working in the realm of kinesthetic empathy, of really letting that inform the exchange between the therapist and the client. And I think um, I, I discovered for myself then, and I think it's probably true for all of us or many of us in dance therapy, the capacity um, to understand kinesthetic empathy is not the same in, in different people. And that perhaps those of us in dance therapy have a heightened um, capacity to deal with that, to deal with kinesthetic empathy, to pick up information, that that's what we do all the time. And so perhaps that's why we went into dance therapy or that that's mm -hmm. how we operate in dance therapy. Mm -hmm. So this innate quality in people to have a higher capacity for kinesthetic empathy that draws us in to do the work. I think so, mm -hmm. um, because I've always felt that about myself, uh, that that was a highly sensitive area for me, and I would imagine it would be for other, other dance therapists. Mm -hmm. As far as the essence of dance therapy in general, the most important quality, I think, in dance therapy is the simultaneous experience of um, the physical reality and the symbolic uh, meaning of that physical reality, that the simultaneous experience of that, that doesn't happen all the time in dance therapy, but when it does, it's a very important moment. And that's the core of all rituals throughout the, the world is the simultaneous experience of the physical reality of what's happening and what it means. Um, so I think that's the real core of dance therapy. Mm. I love that. And I, I, from my own practice, you know those moments right as they're happening and there's it, it almost feels like magic is happening in the moment that you you can hardly even believe what you're experiencing with somebody because it's such a a profound and intimate experience to have the the physical and the symbolic interact like that exactly and so well, that's why i think that's the the real essence of dance therapy mm -hmm. Right. And I love that you also noted the nonverbal, the importance of nonverbal communication and um, 
I know that you have studied the MPI extensively with Martha Davis. Um, mm -hmm. I believe you're a CMA. No, so I'm not a CMA. I never, never did that. I, I taught with Ermgard. I used to assist her teaching. Mm -hmm. I, I never completed the CMA. I'm mm -hmm. embarrassed to say, but I never did. No I problem. I don't remember why, but um, I didn't. Do you want to talk a, a little bit about your time with Ermgard? Oh yes, I. How? Yes, of course, because I. I worked with her uh, quite a bit at Bronx uh, State, as it was called then, Bronx State Hospital, Bronx mm -hmm. Psychiatric Center, when Alyssa White was there and Claire Schmace and Martha Davis mm -hmm. and, and Ermgard. So I, <clears throat> I learned a great deal from her and uh, learned about kinesthetic empathy, uh, a great deal from her also. She, and I remember her, um, I can't remember specifics, but I remember her articulating this quite a bit because we would watch we would watch patients through a one-way screen some sometimes and have a discussion. So I learned a great deal from um, Ermgard, and I, uh, I, as I said, she asked me to assist her teaching once, and that was quite an important experience. I me I remember an experience with her. Uh, where you could really feel the healing energy coming from her, not in terms of the kinesthetic connection, that um, there was something extremely powerful and, and special about her connection to other people. Mm. Uh, and she had this certain kind of energy that was palpable. Mm -hmm. When you think about Ermgard Bartinieff and you're studying with her, and then you think about Marion Chase and you're studying with her, you noted kinesthetic empathy as kind of primary points for both of those teachers. Do you think that they perceived it or um, taught it or experienced it comparably? Or do you think there was some subtle shifts between the two of them? Uh, I, I think that it was very important to both of them, uh, probably with different perspectives. Uh, I can, and I can't quite I have to think about it, how, how you would put the two perspectives. Perhaps Ermgard was more sp specific because she would watch behavior and uh, describe it and interpret it. Mm -hmm. uh, Marion uh, didn't do that that much. Um, she wasn't, uh, she, she didn't, she didn't interpret that much verbally. Mm -hmm. So perhaps Ermgard was a little more specific and focused about that, but otherwise I, I, I would have to think more about their specific differences in, in the approach to kinesthetic empathy. Mm -hmm. Equally, it was very important to both of them, I know mm -hmm. that. It makes sense what you're saying also, because I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but people, when people think of Ermgard Bartini, if they think um, a little bit more under the alignment of a movement analyst, like looking at movement and analyzing the movement. Whereas when we think about Marion Chase, we think about a dance therapist, right? So the intention of the, the final product might be a little bit different, which may inform the more an analytical part of Ermgard's versus the more maybe relational components of Marion's. Except that Ermgard had, had clearly had a, a, a very strong relational uh, mm -hmm. aspect to her work also mm -hmm. in this kind of energy exchange, which, which I don't think she articulated that much. It was just a part of her. Mm -hmm. But you, you, uh, you described the differences very well. Okay. Sometimes I get corrected that I'm, I'm not, not quite on point with what I'm hearing. So, um, okay. So I'm going to ask you to think back about your time as a dance therapist and ask if there's a particular patient experience that you had that was meaningful that you would like to share. Oh. It can be more than one, also, if you think of a few. 
Oh, I can't think of a few. It's, it's I, see, I do remember once, uh, I think it was at Bronx Psychiatric Center, and I was working in a group and um, a severely, dis, you know, psychotic, schizophrenic uh, clients. And there was one woman who uh, somehow <clears throat> grabbed onto me mm. and uh, wouldn't let go, and uh, it was quite quite frightening. And I realized, and, and somehow I don't think I thought that much, but I instead of resisting her or trying to get away and pull away, I just stayed with her mm. and uh, relaxed, and I stayed with her, and in a minute or so she released me. Mm -hmm. um, I think that taught me, uh, that was a very important moment for me because it, it taught me the importance of the nonverbal communication, uh, which, you know, which she understood somehow and which I, and uh, the importance of the, um, of the nonverbal behavior without uh, pre-planning that, you know, I just sort of did it. Uh, so it taught me a lot about the importance of, of the nonverbal realm. And also it taught me uh, something about not trying to do something to clients, mm. to uh, see what it was that they really wanted to do and to, and to facilitate or go with them on that journey, but not try to do something for them or, or to them. Mm. That whole experience sort of gave me that perspective. I think that is such an important example to share for many reasons, but particularly I'm thinking of two. First is that um, there is a stigmatization that goes along with people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia, and there is a fear that people often have if you don't work with this population or understand this population, right? Mm -hmm. And so it would make sense that the first thing people would think of if somebody grabs you, whether they're have experiencing psychosis or not, when somebody grabs you, you want to kind of pull away from, right? Yeah. You, don't, you don't want to allow um, but in this circumstance to just allow and, right, I always think of the yes and, so you allowed it and instead of um, kind of labeling it as inappropriate or aggressive or scary or et cetera, et cetera, right, you just allowed it to exist and then you... Um, stayed with, right? I always think about when I work with people with schizophrenia, I always try not to say no in my sessions because they've heard no their whole lives in every capacity. Mm -hmm. So how do we say yes and create safety, right? So I think that's really important to for people to hear that when you're in a circumstance like that, there are many options that you can go with. It's not just the instinctual, no, don't, don't touch me, don't put hands on me, yeah. move, move away. Yeah, so that, that's the really the most important experience I remember from my, uh, yeah. my early training. Yeah, and it's a beautiful one. And then the second part of that also, Mimi, is this idea of really tuning into the nonverbal as a communication versus a behavior, right? Mm -hmm. So that person was trying to communicate something with you and pending your, re your action or your reaction, which you did not react, you acted thoughtfully in a way that kind of gave agency to them to maintain relationship and to be in that space together. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I've, I've always tried to um, keep any verbal interpretations or explanations to a minimum mm. because I, I found that if I, if, if I operate with them internally, but don't 
necessarily have to share them with the, the patient, that, that that gives me more freedom to see where it is that they're going and what that they want and what they're doing. Mm. Um, so, so that initial experience that, that was clearly a, <laughs> an important one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the verbals, it sounds like verbalizing or over verbalizing might diminish opportunity, right? It might put some limitations around things. So I've, al I've always, you know, been very aware of the, the power and the importance of words and that we, working in dance therapy, we have to be extremely careful with the verbal um, exchange because it has so much power. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Specific you, power. Do you want to say anything more about that? Uh, you know, just, you know, that I, 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 I do try to <clears throat> communicate that to, to my students is that, you know, words are, uh, can be extremely powerful and have to be carefully, carefully dealt with in dance therapy because they, they somehow have great power. There are dance therapists, of course, who, who operate without, without any verbal exchange. They don't think words are important. And that's, that's a valid way of, of working also. I do think words are important, but I think you have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thinking about dance therapy and, and kind of the way things are shifting and shift is inevitable, um, what about your knowledge would you like to see carried on into the future of dance therapy? What about my knowledge? Or just your understanding of dance therapy and your, your experience, your practice? Well, um, I, I don't want to repeat. So the one thing, uh, another thing that is very important that I is the whole aspect of the creative process mm -hmm. that in dance therapy, you are <clears throat> hopefully operating always with creating what from nothing or creating from what is there mm -hmm. and that <clears throat> you're in a, um, a you are you are in the state of being an artist in a way of creating with the material as it as it comes up and as it appears and that's um that's what you have to do all the time so i think in terms of what knowledge i would like to have continue is to have that understood more i don't i don't think that that's emphasized um enough although i may be maybe mistaken but i think to teach students that <clears throat> the creative process is a is a, an essential part of dance therapy mm -hmm. which sometimes is not emphasized mm -hmm. that's that's one of our connections to dance as a as a as an art form but it's extremely important in therapy. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the creative process, um, I could make assumptions, but I'll just have you clarify. Do you mean the creative process for the dance therapist? Do you mean for the client or participant? Do you mean for both? I, I, I mean for both, but I'm, I'm emphasizing it in terms of the, of the therapist mm -hmm. that, or the dance therapy student should be helped to recognize that there's always material, there's always material to work with mm -hmm. and to open um, the perspective, to open the range of seeing that and being able to create from that and therefore allowing the client to become creative also, mm -hmm. to expand their range and to work with what's inside and what's outside. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's an important part. I, I often hear students ask, well, what should I do? What is the intervention? Why don't, why can't you tell me what to do in this session? And yeah. I always say, well, I don't know. I don't know what to do. You do what you, you do, what you see, you do what you witness, you do what happens, right? It's all improvisational. And I think the way that you described it is a really lovely way to articulate that it's all there. If you trust the creative process, things will happen. It's when we second guess ourselves and when we want to kind of intervene versus experience that I think that gets lost in exactly. the teaching and the practice. Yeah. And I know students are always <clears throat> eager to have a formula to, you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? Mm -hmm. And I think if, if you help them to become strong enough in trusting their own creativity mm -hmm. uh, that will allow them to uh, function much more powerfully as a therapist without having to feel that they have to have a formula for this intervention with that kind of patient. That if they start to trust their own creativity, they will never be at a loss. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Um, is there anything else that I haven't asked that you'd like to share or that I have asked that you've thought more about that you'd like to share? Just want to give you some space to add anything. Not, not uh, particularly, uh, just, uh, you know, to repeat that the important things to me are, are kinesthetic empathy and everything that that involves. Um, the, the, the simultaneous experience of the physical and the symbolic, mm -hmm. which I actually, uh, I remember <clears throat> learning it to begin with, with uh, from Joseph Campbell, who was, you all may know, is, uh, was a great writer about myth and was the husband of my dance teacher, Gina Erdman, I'd like to, uh, who was my teacher at, uh, at Bard, who was a great modern dancer, and, uh, uh, where he talked about <clears throat> that being the base of all ritual, uh, simultaneous experience of the, the real physical experience and the symbolic meaning. So that's very important and extremely important important as I've just talked about is the process of creativity mm -hmm. and um, so in, in which I think students have to be um, have to be not taught but they have to be given the, the understanding how important that is um, instead of having a learning specifics and to trust themselves uh, to do that. And that's an important connection for us. I think we always have to remember our connection to dance as an art form and what that means. And that as dance therapists, we are using an art form to, um, to manifest therapy. Mm. And what does that mean and, and what can we extrapolate from the art form um, to, to work with our clients. And one thing about dance, uh, I will say one as an art form, which is important to me is that, um, I mean, when we study technique as dancers and when we study to be performers, why are we studying technique? We're studying technique and we're coming, becoming technically proficient so that we can have as much control when we perform as possible while we have as much freedom as possible at the same moment, mm -hmm. it's that kind of paradox. And um, I think that's an important concept to remember when we're working with clients is that we're trying to help them <clears throat> have as much control as possible in a way over their behavior their, and their, their experience, but we're trying to help them have it with as much freedom as possible as well. And to try to, to merge those two possibilities because in dance, 
uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, we're trying to be as free as possible with as much control as possible simultaneously. Mm. A paradox. And that's, mm -hmm. what I think what we're trying to help our clients do that also, is to have as much freedom with as much control as we can as well. Mm -hmm. So that comes from dance as an art form, and I think that's important to, to remember. Absolutely. Yeah, the way that you put it is, is so precise in, in the paradox of you must know one to understand the other. And that we are the ultimate goal would be to allow for freedom. And in order to get there, we have to know the control to release it. Uh, even as dancers, uh, we study technique and we try to become as proficient technically as possible so that when we perform, we can be as free as possible. Mm -hmm have to have the balance between that control and that freedom mm -hmm. uh, if you know if you were a performer just being free you would fall off the stage so you have to have that that constant uh, balance between control and freedom and um, I think as a therapist you have to have that and that's what you're essentially working with your clients also is to to find a balance between control and freedom mm -hmm. and dancers have to learn that all the time mm -hmm. because uh otherwise we'd fall off the stage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anything else mimi that you would like to share oh dear um think um you know just that uh the connection i think i think it's important for students to always remember the connection uh to dance as an art form um as therapists um that the creative process is very important to keep alive uh, mm -hmm. in in their work with clients uh, the creative process as you um, experience it as a dancer, mm -hmm. uh, as a choreographer, as uh, uh, that that creative process is what can modulate and and help you as a therapist, mm -hmm. and uh, so that there are many aspects of dance as dance therapists that we have to um, remember and keep alive in ourselves. Um, why are we using dance as therapy? Um, and there, there are many aspects of dance that we have to keep alive uh, because they are important additions to the whole world and the whole work of therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why we're dance therapists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, it's just any, these are the final thoughts before we wrap up, so. Yeah, I'm, you know, I, I think, you know, dance was used as dance therapy because there are many aspects to dance as an art form that uh, are very powerful and can, can connect to therapeutic goals and therapeutic processes. And that's why dance became dance therapy. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to um, remember that and uh, keep those strong as dance therapists. That mm -hmm. that's, that's why we're dance therapists. That's, there's something, there, there are aspects to dance that with the reason it became dance therapy and we have to uh, hold on to that. Mm -hmm. So if there are no more thoughts, then I have just um, been inviting interviewees at the end of our time together as a, a bit of closure um, to join in a little bit of movement. 
So wow. I would love to invite you to um, share some dance or some movement. It can be seated, it could be standing, it could be whatever you would like that I could kind of join in with you to wrap right. time together. Um, hmm. Don't think too much about it. Don't think too much. We just trust the process. Uh, I don't want to stand up. Oh, breathing is important. <laughs> breathing is important. Interesting. I forgot what you asked me to do. Just to move with me. <laughs> That's the important thing is to move. <laughs> exactly. I'm breathing. <laughs> Stillness, I found, is also very important <laughs> to keep the to keep the um, the aliveness in the stillness. Mm -hmm. Dr. Miriam Raskenberger, I want to thank you so much for this conversation and, and sharing your thoughts and your experiences um, about dance therapy and who you studied with and how your time went. So thank you so much for this time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Pleasure talking with you.